All right, so we're recording now. Good morning, everyone. I'm Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester and host of this Forest Connect webinar series. For those of you who are participating in this live session, if you'd like a copy of this, and it's always, I, I always recommend it's a good idea to have it. You can delete it if you don't want it later. But if you go to the file menu in the upper left-hand corner and go to Save As and then select Document, you have the option to save this document uh, to your computer. It defaults to a file type of a universal communication format, which is not what you want. You'd think universal would be universal, and uh, actually it isn't. So save it, select the file type as a PDF or a portable document format, and just click Save, and it'll save it to your computer. So you won't have the audio, um, you won't be able to manipulate it, but you'll have the slides and, and you'll be able to refer back to it if it, for some reason you'd like to do that. So, all right, um, it's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers, Jeff Ward and Tom Worthley. Jeff is with the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station and Tom is with the University of Connecticut Cooperative Extension uh, System out of the University of Connecticut. So I've known uh, both of them for several years and they are, um, both very fun people, and aside from that, they have a great deal of, of know-how on a lot of things related to forests and forest management, in particular dealing with uh, roadside forest management on a tree-by-tree -tree basis. So I will, uh, at this point, I'm just going to stop. I'll let Jeff proceed from here, and he and Tom will work through the process of, of coordinating the presentation, and I'll hover in the background and uh, assist with technical issues if they come up. So Jeff and Tom, thank you for joining us and it's all yours. Thank oh, you. Thanks, thanks a lot, Pete. I was going to say, you should say we've known each other since at least 85, so go back a long ways. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're going to be talking about some work that we've been doing here and a lot of it's just thinking too on how to manage uh, roadside trees. And if we're going to say it, it's more than just roadside trees. I thought I'd start out with just a, a little bit of a smile on her face that we sort of have this love-hate relationship with trees, uh, especially when they're along roadsides. Whoops, hit the wrong button, there we go. So here's the problem we have, is that during windstorm events, not just windstorm events, but ice storm events and occasionally heavy wet snow events, 90% of power outages are tree related. So what's the solution we wanna have? Well, a big part of it is, we don't manage a roadside forest, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But part of if we want to manage the roadside forest is we need to know, to get a cost-benefit analysis, to figure out how to do this in an economically feasible way. You know, if you had unlimited money, you could do whatever you want, but we need to make it cost-effective. The other thing is when you manage roadside trees is you're going to have to have community acceptance, and that's a big part of it. And the communities, Tom's going to talk more on that towards the end of the talk, it's not just the people drive by, but it's also the folks who own the land. It's also the public officials who uh, have to do a lot of the maintenance, and it's also acceptance by the power company. And a big part of that is we need to understand how individual trees react to wind and to being grown in the open. Uh, Jeff, can I ask you to uh, slide back to that other slide real quick? Absolutely. I wanna call people's attention to the um, uh, photograph on the left of this tree that's hanging in the wires um, and uh, point out that it's uh, in, a, in addition to individual tree biomechanics, we also want to uh, consider this question at the stand level. Notice that tree it wasn't an immediate roadside tree, the one that's hanging in the wires. It came from about 40 feet back in the woods and um, uh, that uh, points out to us that it's not just a tree issue, it's a forest management issue that we're, uh, that we're dealing with here. Thank you. No, that's a great point, Tom. So one of the things, like I was sort of saying earlier, is we're not just talking about trees alongside of highways. We're talking about trees that go through woodlots. We're talking about uh, corridors going through forests. We're talking about any place where trees come up to a hard edge. It could be a field, it could be a highway, it could be a stream, it could be a, a lake. And all of these, we need to think that those trees on the edge are subject to much more wind stress, and they're gonna to tend to grow towards the light, which means their center of gravity is gonna naturally wanna to grow towards that opening, if it's a road, if it's a field, or God forbid, it's a house. 
So we're going to talk a little bit today about what you can do to manage that. But first, let's just take a, a little bit of a, a look at the scope of the problem. Is throughout the the country, we all have dealt with uh, with wind damage, and it's been a problem for forever since we've had roads, winds knocking down uh, trees and and blocking things. And it's not just wind though; it's ice storm damage. Here in Connecticut, we don't have as, as many ice storms as you tend to have in the northeast and a little bit further south, but ice damage or heavy wet snow can obviously damage trees. And I think the first thing that comes to mind when trees uh, come down across the road is that we, we can lose the power, we can have blocked roads. But what you might not think about and why it's critically important too is emergency vehicles, firefighters, ambulances, can't get through. And in fact, until those trees start being cleared, they can't even repa replace the power line. So it's it's a big, big deal. Now here in Connecticut, about five years ago, we actually went through three storms that caused massive damage. We had uh, a Halloween snowstorm uh, that dropped a foot of snow when the leaves were still on the trees and people were without power for a week. Uh, that actually was about a month after we had Tropical Storm Irene and people lost power for a week. And then we had Superstorm Sandy, uh, which hit you know everywhere from New Jersey up into uh, Connecticut, New York, and a little bit of Massachusetts. And again, people lost power for over a week. So here in Connecticut, this is the genesis of all this, the governor said, we got a problem here. And at first there were calls to cut down every tree within 50 feet of a highway which I don't think any of us want to see. So he pulled together a group of people from throughout the state and they came up with an interesting fact, even here in Connecticut, where we're a fairly developed state, 36% of our roads go across landscapes that would be considered forested uh, landscapes in a traditional rural sense. And Tom, you came up with sort of a number of how many acres that was? Yeah, if you uh, take 7,600 acres and you, uh, I mean 7,600, miles and you multiply that by uh, 100 feet, which would be a typical uh, total height of a, of a tree stand along most of our roadsides, you'd have about 75,000 acres of forest land uh, that's along roadsides in the state of Connecticut. And we're going to talk a little bit about later why that's sort of a neglected forest resource. So they came up with a whole bunch of recommendations, but I think three of them are, are pretty interesting for those of us who are, are foresters or who like managing forests. Is one of them, we need to manage the roadside forest for storm resistance. But we also need to have scientific standards for tree removal. And part of what Tom said earlier, it's not just the trees that are right on the edge of a, a forest uh, or trees that are uh, on the edge of a woods road, but it's also trees that can be upwards to 100 feet. So how do we identify those trees which are most at risk of failure? And the other big thing is we need to talk to the public about forest and tree stewardship. And, and here's the thing, mature trees and landscape are the typical landscape that we have now, but this did not happen overnight. And at this point, I'm gonna pass the baton to Tom and he's gonna talk a little bit about how did we get into this problem? Thanks, Jeff. Um, the um, the point is that uh, when uh, when we when we first started stringing power lines along roadways, there wasn't a, a lot of forest there. In Connecticut at one time, about 75% of the land was cleared for agricultural purposes, cropland and pasture land, and the you know most of the roadways were dirt roads and so forth and so on. And uh, and the um, uh, in the late uh, 1800s, in the middle, in the early 1900s, um, we saw a, a period of farm abandonment and then uh, regrowth of the forest uh, in places that had been cleared for charcoal. I mean, cleared for agriculture. And uh, here's a uh, here's a shot of um, of uh, you know a typical agricultural setting uh, in the early 1900s, and then uh, uh, what it looks like today. Um, along a, a similar stretch of road, uh, but uh, uh, following the um, uh, the abandonment for agriculture, uh, there was a regrowth of the forest and uh, uh, and then a harvest again for charcoal production over much of the state, uh, which uh, lasted until the late 1920s. And so the forest we have around us uh, today um, has grown since the late 1920s. 
Um, they began stringing power uh, lines along roadways uh, at the at that time and into the 1930s and 40s. And uh, the power infrastructure has grown since the 1930s. Most new development is in wooded areas these days. So uh, they punch uh, uh, roads into uh, areas that are already uh, uh, in even age forest that's 80 to 100 years old, and they expose trees that have never been exposed to the wind to uh, edge type conditions. And while the power in distribution infrastructure was conceived when, when trees were younger and smaller, it hasn't really been adjusted for the aging forest resource. Uh, but we can manage this forest resource uh, in ways that make it, uh, uh, give it an age structure, a species mix and a density uh, to be more storm resistant. Uh, here's our graphic of, uh, of the 19, uh, 1920s, uh, growing up uh, typically around uh, uh, the power pole, the wooden power pole and roadway that you uh, see typically. And these days, this is what we have. And as, uh, as Jeff mentioned, all the trees along the edge of the road uh, grow out over the road because that's where the space is. And um, uh, it's not a matter of if those trees fail, but when they finally fail, they're going to uh, tip towards the, uh, towards the roadway. Um, the uh, Northeast landscape in Connecticut, uh, forest is the natural vegetative cover. If you fly over the state today, this is what you see. And um, we live in a time when um, uh, there are uh, uh, more, uh, more people living within the woods uh, than we've ever had anywhere else in the world uh, at any other time in history. This particular slide shows uh, new development that has uh, occurred since 1985, uh, south, uh, southwest of Waterbury, Connecticut. Uh, most of the, all of the red represents uh, uh, new developments, new roadways, new uh, residential developments that have been put in. Uh, and, and I would say probably 90% 90 of, 90 of these new developments have been constructed in areas that was uh, uh, forest cover. Uh, grown back from uh, the early part of the 1900s. You want to take over from here, Jeff? Sure. Go ahead and pass the baton. I will do that. Well, the, the one thing you can't really say, I didn't realize we can't, I shouldn't make this into two slides, is just like it's sort of the, uh, the background slide. And what happens in a lot of our typical uh, forest, roadside forest, is and actually there's a, a great point that um let's see perno made or, or yeah, made about it's not just the side of the, the of the forest that has the uh the wires on it it's also the other side and what can happen or what does happen is if a tree has its center of gravity is it has its weight going towards the road or towards the wire how many loggers feel comfortable dropping those all they have to do is drop one tree in front of a car. All they have to do is drop one tree onto a power line. And basically, they've just dropped incredibly big dollars. And God forbid somebody gets hurt. So what happens is, is we have this no management zone. What Tom talked about, you know, 100 foot wide, which means there's basically, uh, shoot, I'm trying to remember how many acres that is for every mile of roadway that we have. It's just a no management zone. No one does anything. So junk trees accumulate in there unless they go down in storms. And it's not just alongside of our secondary roads, you know, our secondary highways, but it's alongside of a lot of interstates. We see where trees are creeping back in to overhang the highways and, and people occasionally get killed. Well, one of the things we did is uh, we went out there and, and uh, eight spots right now, we actually looked at, oh shoot, I thought I converted this to, English. Well, it doesn't matter. Uh, the big point is, if you look in the, the bottom, it says distance from utility poles. And where it says 10, 20, 30, 40 meters, think about it that as half a chain, one chain, a chain and a half. So 30 meters is basically 100 feet out. And what we see is that the forest, if you look in the right-hand side of the graph, and these are pole timber trees that are anywhere from uh, 4 to 11 inches in diameter. We looked at the, the number of trees per acre in each one of those zones, is once you start getting back, you know, about 75 feet back into the forest, we see that it's really, there's a pretty constant level of density out there. But that zone that says 10 meters away, that's like 30 feet meter, 30 meters away from the road or from the wires. That's where you really get this accumulation of young pole trees. 
And think about this when you drive home tonight. How many of those trees are leaning towards the road? They're leaning towards the road because that's where the sunlight in is what Tom talked about earlier. So it's not only pole trees, the trees of the future, but it's even to a lesser extent we see saw timber trees. And you know, if, it, if there's a really valuable trees within that first, you know, 100 feet or so of the road, uh, if it's really valuable, you know, somebody might try to cut it down, but if it's got any defect at all or has any weight at all leaning towards uh, the road, then indeed it's not gonna be cut down. So Pete just put down there, it's uh, about 12 acres to the mile, which is a pretty amazing amount that's not done. And to answer the question there about the cost roadside maintenance, we're going to get to that later. That's a great question, and that was a key thing. If I can, so, uh, if I can add something to the discussion about that graph, well, we all know from looking at uh, stocking guides over the years that uh, uh, that high, highly dense condition, um, without without changing the the diameter. Uh, uh, the diameter structure and number of trees is a really unhealthy condition for trees to grow in. They grow under stress. Uh, they're subject to uh, a variety of um, uh, other stressors in the environment when they're, uh, when they're grown in such a dense condition. And that's a great point because one of the things when you have those dense conditions is what happens? We get a small live crown ratio. So you end up with trees that are tall and skinny, almost like telephone poles, was just this sail up on top. And that makes them much more susceptible to be blown down uh, during a windstorm. Did you, did you include the slide there, Jeff, about, uh, about the ages too? Um, no, I did not. Well, then I'll make that comment here that uh, uh, as we went along through uh, uh, making those measurements, uh, uh, we made note of the, the species mix and uh, understanding that our roadside forest is in many cases cases uh, 80 to 100 years old and even older uh, in understanding that the composition of our forest is um, um, comprised of trees that uh, many of which uh, have a natural lifespan of 100 to 120, 100, 100 to 120 years. Uh, we are looking also at a highly dense structure of trees that are really old trees. Not all of them, you know, certainly some of them are, you know, have a long have a long time left, but uh, um, you know there are some trees in that forest that are you know just sort of on the way out anyway, and uh, um, you know they're contributing to the problem. So yeah, we have up just another slide just to reemphasize that when trees go down, they can just cause a real problem, especially when they're mixed in with wires, as is in case this place, because you can't just simply go and cut up the tree and move it to the side of the road. The power company has to turn off the power before the tree crews can get, even get into there. So what's the challenge? Well, the challenge is one of the reasons we have roadside trees is people like the way they look. And it's amazing that immediately after a storm, everyone wants to clear the trees around, clear the trees off so they have power. But after a couple of months go by, people start screaming at the power companies who they just asked to cut down the trees, that they're making it look like a biological desert, that it's ugly what they're doing. So they want to maintain the trees on the side of the road. The other thing we need to do is, is think about when we're doing the management is how do we mitigate the potential for tree caused damage to infrastructure? What that means is how do we make it less likely that the trees are growing there are going to damage the infrastructure? And this is a key thing is how do we make the treatments cost effective? And like I said, especially towards the end, Tom's going to talk about some ways to keep the cost down. One of the things we've done here is we've uh, partnered with a lot of folks, including the local utility companies, because you know what? The fact that when a tree goes down, a lot of times uh, utility companies are gonna have to come out and clean up part of it just so they can get the wires done, or the town's gonna have to clean it up. The, the big thing is, is trying to figure out a way to make this cost effective, so we'll be addressing that. And before I pass the baton over to Tom, I just wanna note that we've had been very fortunate. We've had a lot of cooperators on this. We got some initial funding from the Forest Service, but beside uh, University of Connecticut and the uh, Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, Audubon Connecticut's been interested in it in helping us design roadside habitat. We've had the power companies, uh, and we've had some uh, great cooperators from uh, local landowners and land conservation groups. And even here in Connecticut, we're doing one of our project sites is working with the Department of Transportation because for them, this is not only a safety issue, it's a cost issue. 
So they want to know how they can manage their trees more cost effectively. Well, let me just go one more point on that whole cost thing. One of the things with when you're thinking about cost is when you start paying people to, to clean up after a storm, they have to, uh, you know, commonly that's an overtime situation. Um, but if you do it beforehand, you can pay people at, at regular rates. So it, sooner or later, those trees are going to have to be taken care of. So do you want to do it at regular pay or do you want to do it at overtime pay? So now I'll let Tom talk a little bit about what we've been working on. Well, we um, we have the uh, uh, the um, power company doing pruning, uh, spending uh, seventy five million dollars a year just on tree pruning along along the roadways uh, to do their um, uh, to do their their man their regular management, which repeats every four or five years. And um, we we like to think that a portion of that uh, investment could be put into uh, a slight modification of the pruning that lends itself then to uh, a little deeper um, uh, management of the roadside forest. And um, uh, and this would allow us to affect some of the, the silvicultural um, uh, treatment that we'd like to do. Uh, we've uh, been, as far as vegetation management research is concerned, we've been, uh, uh, trying to develop some protocols for uh, recommend, recommending those activities. Okay, what trees should we uh, decide to leave? Which trees should be removed? Which trees need to be topped out so they can be dropped? Um, uh, then uh, once the once we've created some research and demonstration sites, we've been monitoring the the, the stand changes and the bio biodiversity changes in these areas. Uh, we've been looking at uh, how we can market. Uh, uh, some of the wood products that might be derived. Uh, sometimes it's simply a matter of teaching the tree crews how to make logs. You know, uh, uh, their job is to get the tree on the ground safely, uh, uh, th of course, uh, right along the roadside. Uh, but can we also do that in a way uh, using some slightly modified techniques that also allow for the extraction of the most valuable material that that tree might have in it? Um, and then um, uh, we'll monitor this over time to see uh, whether we do get any disruptions in the areas that we have treated uh, caused by severe weather. And then uh, reach out to the, um, the uh, public officials and uh, uh, the practicing professionals uh, about, uh, uh, about these things so that they have an understanding about it as well. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things that I have uh, uh, been saying to the, to the utility company right along is that uh, over the long haul, we would like to think there would be, in a, in a big storm event, the, we, we don't expect to uh, um, achieve 100% success in all the traded areas, but we would have a, um, um, a, a lot fewer power outages to begin with, that those that did occur would last uh, a shorter period of time, the cleanup would take less time, and that over the long haul, uh, the utility uh, might be able to manage the um, uh, manage the forest uh, it, over a longer rotation instead of coming back every four or five years that uh, perhaps they'd, ever, they'd come back every 10 or 15 years and the management would be done from the ground rather than a bucket truck. So this, uh, this map you're looking at shows all the various uh, sites we have uh, around the state where some of this work is uh, going on, uh, uh, roadside forest management demonstration sites, uh, at least one in every county. Uh, we have three tree biomechanics research uh, sites where uh, trees are, are wired for movement, uh, and we're tracking that, and uh, a couple of uh, value recovery pilot projects uh, that are being done in cooperation with uh, local towns in which uh, uh, trees in the, in, the, in the public right away that are being removed um, are being uh, sorted out for uh, materials of, of value and then being sold on the log market with the funds uh, proceeding from the sales coming back to the town, uh, being put in, hopefully being put in some uh, account for, uh, uh, to help their local tree committee or whatever the case may be. So the key principles that we're following all along the way are that like any plant, tree with space to grow is going to be a healthier tree. So we want to reduce the density in most cases. And this is, you know, this is silviculture 101. Uh, tree tops and branches grow towards the sunlight, and uh, we also know from uh, from uh, thinning research and that sort of thing that uh, when you create a gap in the canopy, the 
the branches of the surrounding trees will grow towards that gap uh, and fill it in. And so we're taking advantage of that uh, that principle to um, um, to apply here. Um, one thing that's not uh, that's not uh, well known by folks, but uh, we're looking into a little more deeply, is that trees allowed to move in the wind will develop wind firmness. When you think about it, that tree uh, that's uh, out in the open field or along the fence line is uh, uh, moving all over the place. It has a great big spreading crown, and it's allocated resources to the base of the trunk and the root system uh, to develop uh, uh, wind firmness uh, uh, so that it's, uh, it's a much more stable uh, tree. Uh, this will make uh, all the foresters uh, perhaps cringe a little bit in terms of uh, forest uh, management. And uh, but remember, we're talking about that that roadside strip that you haven't used in a hundred years anyway. So uh, if we grow some trees with some taper to them, why it's not necessarily the end of the world. Uh, we can have all the other functions going on in that forest uh, ecosystem services that we uh, all depend on. And then it's also a matter of growing the right tree in the right place. Uh, can we use silvicultural principles to um, uh, uh, select for a species mix closest to the road of trees that won't develop height, you know, if you will, that is, it won't develop as much height as something else, and uh, and select for the species mix further away from the the road that the, for the hickory trees and the tulip trees and the white pine trees that'll grow a lot taller. Uh, right now, this is what the the power company is doing. They're uh, they're clearing uh, the um, uh, the branches away from uh, uh, the, you know the trees uh, that are closest to their um, to their conductors and uh, those that are above their conductors. Uh, and this really you know this does take care of some of the problem. It certainly uh, addresses everything that would uh, uh, result from direct uh, a direct fall due to gravity. You know, uh, which you know, these things happen sometimes even uh, outside of storm events, and so uh, it's addressing that problem fairly well. Um, but uh, as uh, we've shown here, the you know trees uh, uh, further away from the road can still fall towards the power line in a in a wind event. Uh, we would much rather have a um, a condition uh, along the roadside of trees that aren't so tall. <coughs> excuse me, that are grown with the uh, um, in a less dense condition, so they develop a bushier crown, uh, a mix of age classes, and um, uh, uh, you know a stand that can be that can be managed from the ground. Um, these uh, trees on the right hand side we would consider to be uh, a lot more uh, wind firm, uh, certainly than the ones on the left hand side of the road there. Tom, yep. If I can step in. You know, I, I grew up in the uh, corn and bean fields of the Midwest, and for those of you who are, have been around any farm fields, you've seen those old solitary trees that are out in the middle of the field, and we've all seen, you know, big open-grown trees. And when those trees, when there's a storm, when they break apart, what happens? The branches fall straight to the ground because they're heavy towards the base. And those trees, I don't know if I've ever seen one of those large open-grown trees actually uh, form a tip-up mound and heave over. They tend to break up in place. That makes them much less likely to fall onto a road, to fall onto a wood trail, to fall onto a building, to fall onto a power line. As opposed to what I think all of us have seen, if we look at those trees there on the left, we have those dense forests and those trees are just, they're just asking to be blown over in a windstorm. And I'm sure we've all seen that happen during a, a severe windstorm. Uh, people ask me about those uh, those dense stands, and they, well, aren't those trees kind of mutually uh, uh, supportive? And and in a way, they are. Uh, but uh, it only takes one uh, uh, to uh, to give up uh, in a windstorm, and then all of a sudden you have a gap. Uh, the the dynamics change in the stand, and you get this domino effect. Or um, as I often uh, think of, uh, it's like somebody set a big bowling ball down, and uh, you know a whole bunch of trees in a row will. Will go over uh, in that uh, in that uh, strong microburst or, or, or wind event uh, that takes place. And uh, so uh, we'll go on to the next slide here. Um, what we're suggesting is that uh, we're not going to clear all the trees away from the power from the edge of the road, but select a few that we think are good um, uh, candidates for future. Um, uh, 
development of uh, uh, perhaps of wind firmness, those trees that are straight, those trees that are symmetrical, that are, those trees that are uh, uh, well balanced and give them space, remove all the ones that are risky uh, right close to the road and also remove some uh, away from the road, away, uh, a ways back in to give some space on the backside. Basically, um, a lot of people will think about uh, crop tree management type techniques where we give uh, uh, some space all around the crown of a, of a, of a desirable tree. And uh, it will, uh, it will uh, hopefully expand back into that space as much as it expands towards the road and will uh, remain um, uh, uh, you know, somewhat symmetric and balanced and will develop some wind firmness over time. At the same time, I'm thinking about uh, many of our stands being this uh, even age uh, stratified mixture and the, in the, in, along with the arbor, arboricultural piece that uh, uh, is managing the immediate roadside, the silvicultural piece would really be thinking about taking that even age stratified mixture and, and taking steps silviculturally to eventually turn it into a, a less dense uh, uneven age stand of the desired species uh, that we want. You want to take it from here, Jeff? Sounds good. So I'll if there's uh, the any engineers out there, any engineer geeks, we just decided to put together, you know, a couple little slides um, showing, you know, how this would sort of look if you had a drone uh, flying overhead. And the upper slide is what we typically see in a lot of our roadside forests. We just have these incredibly dense stands. And as Tom said, all it takes is one tree in that stand going down. And just like we learned back in our very first uh, forest management, forest ecology class, you'll start getting that wave of blowdown happen. And we've all seen it. Uh, one tree goes down, and it's very common that you'll see a whole group of trees go down. The idea we have is let's try to do, you know, sort of crop tree management. Have those picturesque trees in that first 100 feet. You know, we aren't really managing that first 100 feet you know, that 12 acres per mile for timber now. So why don't we manage it for aesthetics? Remember, forestry isn't just managing for timber. It's managing for, you know, whatever benefits the landowner, whatever the landowner wants, you know, that, that's reasonable. And this is just a way to manage that as an aesthetic butter, buffer strip, which will have good ecosystem services. It's good for wildlife. It'll help hold the soil, but it also, you know, maintain the aesthetics, but it won't have that increased risk of trees falling down and blocking a road. Uh, the group I was with, uh, actually, we had a great graphical artist, and she thought of this as thinking of this as sort of what we're thinking about is an amphitheater effect, where the further back you get from a road, you know, up to about 100 feet, you have trees that are progressively taller and taller that maintains the aesthetic and ecosystem function. We really aren't managing that for timber nowadays anyways, so let's manage it for another purpose and maintain, you know, good road safety. So we sort of look at this as having different zones and think about it when you go out there and manage it, when you actually start ma marking trees. And that's actually a very interesting experience because we're used to, to marking to, you know, uh, a certain density, a certain stocking level, as opposed to going out there and selecting trees for what look like wind firmness and then giving them room to grow. And so it's, you're not necessarily marking to a, a certain stocking level. So you're looking at first zone, zone one, which is up to 33 feet distance from a pole or 33 feet distance from a road or a stream. And that's mostly, you're gonna have some taller trees to give that visual break as people drive down on the road or as you walk down the road, but it's mostly shrubs and we all have native shrubs. They'll, they'll look great, but they aren't gonna interfere with the pole. And then in zones two and three, we progressively, and that's up to about 100 feet from the road, we have progressively taller trees. We might have things like dogwoods growing in there. Uh, around here, we could have some viburnums or, or mountain laurel, but just small trees which integrate even blue beech, uh, stria, and carpina uh, and ironwood, which integrate into taller and taller trees. You know, you really don't want to have a tulip poplar or a white pine growing five feet away from a road or a power line or next to a building because if it's weight at all is towards that building or towards that road, sooner or later it's going to fall down and smash it. Uh, a regional uh, 
guy with the uh, utility company here had a great thing. Gravity wins. If the center of gravity is towards that tree, unless you do directional felling, that tree sooner or later is going to fall where it wants to. Yep, gravity is like, the law. <laughs> yeah. Einstein said it right, Vince. We don't have the curvature of space, but we do have trees falling. So that's, like I said, we're looking at a wide variety of, of different uh, conditions when we're going out there and doing that research because this has real applications. What's interesting, if you look at the bottom uh, left-hand corner, uh, that's actually uh, about a 150-foot wide tree island next to, a limited, next to a limited access highway. And that's where the Department of Transportation got interested because they have issues with trees falling across the interstates and blocking traffic uh, during severe weather. Uh, and it can really, you know, if the roads are blocked, you can't get out-of-state power crews coming in and help clearing it up. So they were interested in going in there and seeing how they could clear it off. At the same time, uh, maybe make a little money by segregating apart uh, all the saw logs and to reduce the cost of that operation. If you look at the upper uh, left-hand corner, uh, you'll see an area with a with a the power lines running through it. You'll see a gap that's been created there. This is a, a shot of uh, what, what would you say, Jeff? About a year old, uh, a year after uh, treatment. Yeah, that was that was one of your pots, and I think we all have power lines. Or, well, not all, but we commonly see power lines running through the woods. Yep, and um, you know, uh, shrub community already beginning to develop there. And, and on the other side of the slide, uh, on the right-hand side, upper, uh, here's some work in progress. Uh, a power line that uh, is on, actually on UConn campus runs down to uh, um, an area where uh, we have pump houses that uh, uh, drive the wells. Um, and uh, this power line feeds the pump houses that provide the half the water supply to the, to the university campus. And so here's all these all these trees like a green tunnel growing over the the power line, and uh, we got in there and started this research. I can tell you this, the utilities folks at uh, the university were delighted to see us do this work. Um, and if you look very carefully, you will see uh, uh, the bucket truck uh, is actually working there, <coughs> removing the, the tops out of uh, uh, some larger trees. Uh, off on the right-hand side, you'll see some small equipment uh, that includes a portable sawmill, so we were actually trying to do some uh, value recovery right there at the site. And just because uh, we're a little bit of science geeks, we wanted to put out one of the things we did is we took 30 or 40 different measurements every one of these trees because one of our goals long term is to be able to identify those characteristics which make trees fall over during a storm. So I think our total database now is several thousand trees and you know we're going to have to wait 10, 20 years, but that's pretty typical in forestry to be able to figure out what's going on. But they're doing some more exciting research, and I'm going to let Tom talk about this part before I talk about my <laughs> telephone pole forest. Okay. Um, uh, two areas of, uh, of uh, study that the, um, uh, that the utility is supporting, one is um, tree biomechanics research, um, and the, uh, uh, what this involves is watching how trees move in the wind uh, during a wind event, how far off center they move. And this involves installing a device called a biaxial clinometer uh, at 10 meters uh, in height uh, on the bulls of selected trees uh, in the stand. And uh, we tracked the movement of those bulls for a year, uh, taking a positional uh, piece of data every tenth of a second. Um, they're planning to build a a whole new building here just to hold the data, you know, because there's so many trees, uh, and every tenth of a second, that's a lot of data points. And uh, we have a grad student working on that as we speak. Um, and uh, then uh, following uh, the same trees uh, and their position and their movement, um, uh, following a, a silvicultural treatment, so whether the stand was thinned or was more like a crop tree treatment or something like that, we're seeing how different trees of different sizes, different species, uh, uh, change in their, their movement in the wind uh, uh, before and after treatment. Uh, the, um, the utility is also supporting some research in uh, um, uh, remote sensing, uh, using uh, LIDAR and other techniques to uh, see if we can do an assessment 
of the roadside forest that um, uh, goes along with their uh, power infrastructure data. And um, given that, you know, there's limited time and resources to engage in management along the roadside, uh, can we get a, a feel for where the riskiest places are and where the, uh, uh, where the, we're, we're most likely to do the most good uh, in putting some management in, in place uh, uh, along the power line infrastructure. And uh, the remote sensing uh, technology is uh, way beyond my capabilities to understand, but it's pretty fascinating stuff. It's all yours, Jeff. Oh, I thought you were gonna do it for a couple more. The one yeah. thing that's kind of interesting in, in getting involved in this project is, if you've ever gone out there and really talked with arborists, uh, arborists and foresters, you know, we we aren't antagonistic at all. Actually, arborists, most of them, uh, absolutely love trees. In fact, a pretty high percentage, I, I, here in Connecticut, about a third of them, actually are foresters by training. So they just, uh, you know, have a natural affinity. And what's what's nice is working with them is you learn a little bit about trees at the same time. So if you look in these shots here, we actually in the upper left we have uh, myself is standing there, and I'm standing there. Uh, the guy, the gentleman in the center was actually worked with Department of Transportation, and the guy in the right uh, was uh, works for a company which helps put in uh, the the power lines that go across uh, the country. So getting people in. You know, bottom left, we had the tree crews coming in. The tree crews were really interested in doing this and seeing how we can remove those trees that otherwise they'd have to come out and take care of during a storm or right after a storm. And on the, the bottom, we have a picture where we've got, you know, the, the foresters there in the center and the guys wearing the yellow vest are all with the water company. And the water companies that are interested in trying to figure out how we can minimize this because what can happen during a storm event, and this happened here, when you get a, a lot of trees with tip-up mounds, you suddenly start getting sedimentation into the streams. And they're also curious, as Tom said before, you know, when you lose power, power runs not only uh, the uh, wells for like University of Connecticut, but you know, a lot of us have wells. If you don't have power, you don't have generator. When the power's out, you don't have drinking water. So it's really important that we have, uh, you know, keep the lights on, and it's just great to actually get out there and start working with a diverse group of people. You learn as much as I think you, you teach. So this, one of the things we had, what well, we've had, and someone asked here about the cost, I'm sure you're all curious, is we talk to the power companies and when they do the regular uh, line pruning, if we identify the trees and show them, it's like, hey, you know what? This tree, sooner or later, gravity's gonna win. It's gonna take out your power line. So what we did with, at least with our first ones, is we said, okay, these are areas where we're gonna have commercial sales in back of these projects. So we have a commercial sale. What about the power companies? Not only prune the trees they would normally do, but the trees that are at risk. They drop those back into the forest. So then those trees are utilized at the same time as a commercial harvest, they turn into products. And one of the things Tom talked about, and we talked with the line pruners about is, how to make the cuts so they don't turn uh, a valuable tree into just some firewood that people come by and they pick up some pick up. So that actually can increase the revenue for the landowner. Not a lot, but it's a little. And the power companies just get permission to remove those trees before they knock out the power during a storm and before they have to pay people overtime or bring in an out of state crews to help clean up the lines. And I do want to give credit to uh, Tom's group for the bottom two photos which shows some great drone photos of what it looks like when they start creating these telephone pole forests. Yeah, the, the power company was doing pruning and um, uh, uh, standard maintenance trimming and also enhanced tree trimming. And as Jeff mentioned, uh, uh, when they work along the roadside, they really need to get permission from whoever owns the land to, uh, to remove trees that are going to be removed. And when they do get that permission, what we did was we worked closely with them and had them just chop the trees out. Uh, one of the phenomenons in, uh, phenomena in Connecticut is uh, that if a, if a tree is cut by the power company and then left along the roadside, the scavengers will come along and pick up the wood and think it's theirs, uh, free for the taking. So we had them leave the trunks standing and we used uh, some um, 
uh, directional felling techniques to be able to drop those trunks, as Jeff said, either back into the woods or parallel to the road. And it really does work. We've had trees leaning way out towards the road, you know, 15, 20 degrees, and, uh, you know, using uh, some directional felling techniques, uh, be able to drop it right parallel to the road. Um, this, is a, this is a shot here in this uh, uh, on the left-hand side of a student who was a relative novice, uh, chainsaw novice, uh, applying some, tech, some directional felling techniques on a, on a red pine tree, uh, 120 feet tall, about 40 feet from the uh, power lines um, that uh, was infested with southern pine beetle and, um, uh, you know, using a proper uh, uh, you know, uh, hinge uh, uh, sizing and protection and, uh, and wedge placement and so forth and so on, uh, quite confidently uh, was able to lay that tree right on the ground uh, where she wanted it to go. Um, the uh, the uh, mechanized harvesters uh, do that very, also very nicely in terms of uh, being able to uh, harvest a tree and place it exactly where he wants it to go. And uh, so this is another uh, option available for for higher production uh, uh, or faster uh, production work. Yeah, one of the things that you know everyone is, is always concerned about is the cost, and that's why we're trying to figure out, especially if there's a commercial uh, forest harvest in the background, and coordinating with the power companies to get them to proactively take down trees at a reduced cost for them compared to what they'd have to pay during a storm. The landowner can recover the value. So trying to get all those disparate work groups uh, to work together, because generally speaking, they, they have a fairly common goal. So if we can get them to work together, that's great. This is definitely Tom Singh, so I'm going to let him talk on that. Yeah, uh, I mentioned the red pine. Uh, this was uh, some uh, material on state land. Um, it was in a mixed stand of, uh, of oak and pine, uh, white pine uh, um, and red pine, uh, residual red pine, some, some remnant red pine, and the red pine had to go and um, in the course of doing this treatment, uh, it was just uh, over an acre, about an acre and a half. Uh, there was a number of oak trees that were harvested. All the red pine was harvested. Um, and um, we uh, processed most of it on a portable mill, made a lot of picnic table material out of the, the oak trees uh, for the state and found a local um, buyer for dimension lumber that came from the red pine uh, going into some kind of outbuilding. And, uh, all of this was moved with uh, small scale equipment, a very low impact stuff. In this case, uh, you're looking at a, an RTV with a, with a trailing arch. Um, uh, they make, manufacture these arches right here in Connecticut. So uh, it was a, a, local, uh, a local business all, all around, locally grown, locally utilized, uh, locally processed with locally manufactured equipment, tells a pretty good story. Um, a different site. Uh, this was our this is our power line site I mentioned earlier from uh, uh, the University of Connecticut uh, campus. Uh, one edge of it was a field. The other edge of it was uh, uh, the power line corridor. Uh, we had the uh, the tree trimming crew come in and uh, take the trees out immediately, or, or top the trees out immediately uh, 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 next to the um, next to the power line, and uh, then we did a, a a crown thinning in the remainder of the stand. And um, um, it cost us all, all told to um, about $6,600 to, uh, um, to treat that one acre. But our, we, we, uh, we sold logs roadside, some high grade logs, uh, about 3,600 board feet valuing about $2,400. We had a load of tie logs went out for, got about $900 for that. Um, we estimated about eight cords marketable fuel wood uh, to a value of $1,200. And we have about 1,500 board feet of miscellaneous sawn material that we sawed right there and we have stacked up. Um, and um, we estimate the product value here at about $6,300. So while we still, uh, you know, didn't make money on this, uh, on this treatment, uh, the $6,600 cost did include the, the, the couple days that the tree crew was there doing their work. And so, uh, you know, using, uh, using the arborist crew um, and then uh, following up with uh, uh, sale. And, and I have to admit, in this case, the, uh, the, the quality of the material out of this stand was, uh, was pretty high. Not all stands are going to yield, a, you know, 3,600 board feet of, per acre of high-value grade logs, but uh, uh, in this case it did. 
but uh, you know, it did uh, come very close to the cost of actually doing the treatment. So I'm gonna take a couple slides and I'm gonna pass over to Tom so he can talk about all the communities. But these are some of the stands we've worked with and you can look at, look at the bottom left uh, here. You can see this is one uh, where we've got power lines going through on a, uh, a woods road, it's on state forest land. And you would think, oh, it's just a power line, it doesn't do much. Well, that power line, if you see three wires up on top of a power line, that powers to 10 to 20,000 people around here. So if one of those trees fell down, that means 10 to 20,000 people are suddenly without power. So if you look at the, the slide in the center, you can see what the power company, after they go through, we end up with a telephone pole forest, which is a pretty unique looking thing. But it's much easier for the folks who came in and did the logging to drop those trees because now they don't have to try to figure in the center of gravity of uh, all the top. They can just look at the bowl by itself and it's a lot easier to handle a bowl and it's a lot easier to push over a bowl with wedges than it is with a top because you can see a lot more in what's going on. And then if you look at the upper right, you can see that's what the forest looked like afterwards. And what's interesting is, is one of the, the people who became a cooperator, they were sort of hesitant about doing this practice. Uh, she was very, very worried that, about the aesthetics and she was worried that, uh, it's for a water company, and was very worried that uh, the water company customers, the neighbors, her board of directors were gonna say that they absolutely butchered the forest. When you walk down here, you have uh, just a very diverse range of uh, heights and sizes, and it's just a nice looking woodlot. Another place where we did this was on some private land where they had about 50 acres of commercial harvest and back. And the, the roadside stand they had in this case was actually a mixture of uh, old sugar maple, uh, some pretty crappy looking black cherry, and a lot of ash that was dying. And you can see this is pretty typical of a lot of roadside forests. Just see how dense it is right there and how many trees are leaning towards the wires. Well, we took a look at that stand where there, hey, what about if we space the sugar maple poles, which are nice looking poles, you know, 30, 40 feet apart. And we're gonna turn, they wanna turn that into a sugar bush stand. What's interesting on these two stands, one of the things we do is we put up signs and we'll show you a sign at the end of the talk. Well, actually a couple of slides what the signs look like. But when you work on the roadside, people are always stopping and talking to you. And what's interesting is what do people ask or, or comment on? Uh, you get like one third of the people say, can I have the firewood? You have one third of the people saying you should cut every tree all the way in. And one third of the people saying you shouldn't cut anything. But I tell you, we have never had more people just drop in and talk with us. And when you talk with them and explain it, they actually like what you're doing. I had the same um, the same experience at the site down in Orange. Uh, it was a uh, an area of water company land right across from a residential neighborhood, and uh, we had all kinds of people very interested in what we're doing. And say, and in, in, in fact, I had the road foreman come up to me and says, "Well, I got another 400 miles worth of road in town. You can do this on." You know, so they were very accepting of it. Well, I see we only have about five minutes left, so I'm gonna let Tom go through his communities and. If Peter let us, I can hang around at least a little bit and answer questions that are typed in. So yeah, Tom, go ahead and take I'll, us home. I'll be able to do that too. Um, uh, our goals are to, to gain some professional and public acceptance of the idea of uh, proactive roadside management and um, uh, in, in, increase the, the public understanding of what it means for, in terms of long-term economic and social benefits and then uh, uh, we would have to work very hard to establish cooperation and collaboration amongst the utilities who are the de facto forest managers along the roadside right now, uh, the adjacent property owners, uh, the officials, and developing a, a labor force with the skills to do this work. Um, and uh, this means, uh, uh, you know, borrowing a little bit of uh, knowledge from the uh, the the, um, uh, the arbor arboricultural community and um, um, also uh, some of some from the forest practitioner community, and perhaps thinking along terms of uh, smaller scale um, uh, 
uh, equipment where it's appropriate or combining with uh, 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 commercial harvesting uh, where it's appropriate there. Uh, here's a picture of the sign uh, that uh, we used uh, at, at most of our sites, uh, uh, demonstration sites, so people driving by wondering what was going on. Uh, they see flagging go up, they automatically think you're going to be building a, a, a shopping mall, you know, but uh, <laughs> uh, paint on trees and flagging is, is, uh, is never a good thing, so some signage helps uh, to help um, to help people understand what's, that, that it's really research that's underway. Um, we, uh, this is kind of extension speak. Uh, when we think about building a storm-wise community, um, we're not just talking about a community of place where, uh, you know, we're looking at official commissions or elected officials, as the case may be. Uh, we're also talking about uh, um, building a workforce from people that are knowledgeable and have the skills. So uh, uh, we will be uh, involved with uh, folks, uh, you know, the arborists, the foresters, the people who do forest harvesting, uh, urban foresters, utility arborists, uh, um, and uh, find out uh, where we can uh, develop markets for our material. And um, uh, eventually uh, also reach out to uh, communities of interest. There's a lot of folks out there that are interested in trees, interested in forests, and uh, um, if they're uh, on board with the whole idea of proactive management along the roadside, uh, then they can be a, uh, a trusted voice out there uh, in support of the work that we're trying to do. And there's a number of, of, of types of these uh, groups and associations uh, that we have in Connecticut. I'm sure that in all your states you have uh, uh, similar um, uh, similar groups that might be able to be, uh, uh, you know, brought on board. Um, monitoring, you want to talk about that, Jeff? Well, I just want to say we're going to be following uh, these stands. Although the grants run up, I have every intention of following for 10 years. And just for time, we'll say one of the interesting things is Audubon is also looking at uh, the birds that are using it, not necessarily uh, the ones in this picture, but we're also looking at invasives. Uh, we do have a Stormwise website. It's a little out of date at the moment. One of the one of the meetings I was in this morning, we talked about that very topic about uh, um, you know where we uh, where we go from here in terms of whose um, whose responsibility is to uh, bring this up to date. But it tells the basic story, and what we would like to be doing with this is sharing a uh, uh, sharing research results as they come in and that sort of thing. So uh, here's our contact information if you would like it. Uh, uh, on a uh, nice background shot of the uh, uh, Gab Pouch Road site that we have in East Hampton, Portland area. And uh, um, anytime anybody wants to, to learn more, let us know. If you're interested in a, uh, if you happen to be in the area, you want to see one of these sites, uh, we could probably make arrangements to take and give you a little, a little field trip. And with that, uh, is, there, is there one more slide after that? Well, I saw one question. I was just going through the question to ask is, how long do those poles stand between topping and a logging company coming in? Well, that's one of the things we're doing is working with uh, the utility company and the forester and the logger on coordinating, having the work done when there's going to be, you know, a week or two before the logging operation starts or get the logging operation gets to that area. So they're not standing very long. Um, generally speaking, it's been a couple weeks of I think in one case it was a month. So there's really no log degradation during that time. Yeah. Uh, where we've uh, harvested with small scale equipment and, and doing small quantities, uh, uh, we, we move our equipment right in right after the arborist crew gets done. So they don't stand there very long. So uh, great presentation, guys. Thank you. And there have been several questions that have come up and we'll take whatever time we need uh, as long as you're able to stick around I'm not going to answer any of these questions but so so one kind of um, conversation that was going on in the background you may or may not have caught it was the relative the, the caught not relative the costs of being proactive versus reactive and if um, you know I think there's maybe two at least two dimensions to that you know on on the reactive side if there's a, if there's a storm event and there's, uh, well, so the context is, is, as you mentioned, there's tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of miles of utility corridors in the Northeast, just broadly speaking. And, you know, any state's going to have their own statistic. But in a reactive situation, crews would be mobilized to an area that might be, 
you know, one or two townships or several counties, depending upon the size of the storm. At the at the same time, that the ripple effect of that of that uh, storm event is going to impact not just the crews, local crews, the crews that are brought in from out of state, but the people who are dependent upon those utilities. So there's this cost of so the, the question is really how to do an economic analysis. Uh, defining economics is more than just the cost of of um, rehabilitating a damaged utility corridor and thinking about cost to businesses, cost to people. Um, how, how do you weigh out, or has anybody done an, an economic, you know, a broad brush economic analysis of of reactive versus proactive management? Um, that's in process, Pete. Um, we're um, we're considering that question as we speak. In fact, you know, designing the project that will look out, uh, um, you know, well into the future with respect to, um, you know, what would it mean to have fewer power outages that did not last as long, uh, or management that uh, uh, takes place uh, on a longer rotation, if you will. Um, the power company vegetation um, managers uh, that I have spoken to are are more than happy to cooperate with whatever management is undertaken to be proactive, uh, as long as it isn't costing them any more than what it costs right now. So really it's a matter of redirecting existing um, investments uh, uh, to be appropriate and um, and the and the tricky part is engaging other all the other people that would need to be involved. Right now, uh, they work right along the roadside. Uh, they are authorized to do so by law. Uh, that's their territory. And uh, once they get outside their the territory there where they're allowed to work, uh, there needs to be cooperation and collaboration uh, amongst a whole a host of other people. And uh, uh, you know, each site uh, is going to lend itself. Uh, uh, to covering its own costs or not, uh, this is where uh, um, the uh, the work of professional forest foresters becomes very relevant uh, in terms of uh, understanding uh, uh, timber volumes and values. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you know the immediate costs we can we can look at uh, the long term um, savings uh, to communities and to businesses and to the state of um, not having a Extended power outages during big storms. Well, that's another uh, that's another question altogether. So. Okay, another uh, kind of few questions that came up was as you as you open up the canopy in these uh, uh, areas adjacent to the corridors, you're obviously putting sunlight on the forest floor, and you're providing opportunities for um, invasive or otherwise problematic species. How, and Jeff mentioned some monitoring of invasive plants. Well, the, the one thing we're doing, well, there's there's actually two aspects of that, and that's a great question. One is we're actually going out there and we're treating the invasives when they come in. Most of them are opportunistic right after the disturbance. So yes, we are going out there and treating the invasive. The other thing is, what are you gonna do long-term on these? Because eventually trees would grow back. And what ideally would happen would be every 10, 20 years before those trees got big enough to, uh, you know, damage the power lines when they went down, is you would start managing those more for uh, firewood markets if you, if it's, uh, you know, uh, an area where you can do this. So you, you cut down the trees when they're, you know, six to seven inches in diameter, uh, a little bit, um, I say you're going to have a denser stand, so you're going to be cutting down small stuff, and that's actually a great size to work with with firewood. At least I think so. And so in the, you are going to have to go back and manage these stands. And in the in the course of management, you're going to be selecting for species mix, uh, of course, and uh, and density. Um, you know, and that's really the trick to managing these stands in the future is controlling controlling density. And I I think that. Uh, you know, uh, in the training of a workforce to do this, that uh, invasive uh, control uh, will, you know, would have to be just part of the everyday business that people do. So what I see oftentimes on on power line rights of ways is that the, the prescription is to um, selectively remove species that will grow into the power lines. And so what happens, and these are on, you know, these are on big, um, 
uh, power transmission corridors. Right. The trees are trees are hit with an herbicide or they're cut, stop treated or something, and then the understory of of um, autumn olive and European buckthorn and and honeysuckle and what have you is not addressed, and it's because those those species don't have the capability of growing into the line. So there, some of these prescriptions, at least historically have created situations where they're favoring the development of invasive shrub communities. So as do you think, that's just context, do you think that with the groups that you've been working with that they would be responsive to uh, understanding that it's, that it, you need a, um, a more, you need a, a decision criteria that has greater complexity than just, you know, will it grow into the power lines or not, but, but also take into account uh, being able to identify problematic species and favoring native viburnums or uh, native hollies or dogwoods or whatever. Yeah, that's uh, certainly been the case here. Uh, we've been really trying to promote uh, native species. And once you get them established, uh, they, they tend to do well. Um, I'm not sure about in other parts of the country, it depends upon where you have, but we tend to see more invasives where there's a deer issue. So it becomes even a little bit more complex. It can be tough getting some of the native stuff up when you have a high deer population. Mm -hmm. yeah. True. Uh, I'll echo what Jeff said. We would encourage all along the way, uh, you know, consideration of this uh, of this uh, issue. Um, uh, and um, contrary to what you see in transmission lines, or uh, the example that came to my mind was uh, uh, New England cottontail habitat work, where you get that full sunlight exposure and uh, uh, provide a favorable uh, circumstance for a bunch of these species. Uh, um, we are going to have a partial shade condition along uh, uh, in most of these areas. So, um, yeah, we'll we'll see some barberry. We're we're likely to see a little bit of multiflora rose and winged euonymus. But uh, as we go along uh, with the management program, I think it would be um, highly. Uh, um, a big, or how, how should I say this? A big part of the of the training we do to recognize those species as undesirable. Okay, so this is a two part question. The first, and I'll kind of paraphrase. Um, Peg Van Patten had a uh, made an observation that in she's in uh, mid Jersey. It looks like that there are. Uh, the, the forests are uh, at some level contiguous, um, contiguous forested areas in New Jersey, and that that the treatments that you're describing that would that would uh, provide advantages to the management of vegetation in and around power line corridors would have uh, at least the perception of um, uh, unfavorable responses for birds that are using that as a flyweight. So you have, so, you know, how do you reconcile, is this a community kind of discussion that people need to have about weighing uh, these different outcomes? Or how do you, how do you deal with, I mean, there's obviously, so you're dealing with one set of consequences by managing the vegetation. The management of the ve vegetation may have other, um, you know, uh, uh, negative consequences, real or perceived. So, how do you how do you reconcile the, that potential? Is this like what always happens in natural resource management? There are, there are groups on each side, or how do you how do you manage that? And, and did you come up with did you confront that in any of the meetings that you had with the various groups that you were working with? That wasn't an issue on the ones I work with, Pete, um, because Autobahn's been out there monitoring it, and one of the things at least in uh, New England, the early successional habitat or the mixed habitat like we have here is a lot, is actually, it's a, it's a critical, uh, it says, we don't have enough of it for them for the bird populations they want. So they're actually, some folks might be familiar with the Foresters for the Birds program that started up in Vermont. Cool. And that was raised in part because there's not that early successional habitat, the young forest, that even forest interior birds need because you go into, you look at the last slide we have up there, there's actually a lot of fruit and a lot of seed and a lot of bugs out there. And when you've got nestlings and fledglings, uh, you need to have a protein source. And during the, the spring and early summer, that's all the bugs that are growing out in those young forests. 
And when there's migratory birds going through, there's a lot more fruit and seeds and even bugs to give them the energy to be able to continue, uh, you know, their flights. Um, I would add that um, as with any wildlife habitat management issue, what you do that uh, benefits one uh, uh, array of species um, uh, is has the potential to be detrimental to a whole different suite of species. And um, uh, I think that in considering the management of, of, a, of a power line corridor, you would target your efforts to where, um, you know, the benefits uh, uh, are very, very high and uh, take all these issues up with the community uh, uh, that you're dealing with and, um, you know, weigh the, weigh the consequences and uh, uh, decide accordingly. That's part of what the, uh, the whole extension challenge is, is to, uh, is to you know, uh, help along with uh, uh, understanding all the, different, uh, all the different nuances. Okay. And then kind of the flip side of that is, let's say you want to do this and you're, you're describing the opportunity to integrate roadside management with, I'll say, traditional forest or woodlot management. Um, have there been strategies discussed or, or recommendations for, so who starts the conversation really is the question. So if the power utility company comes in and says, you know, okay, we have, you know, we have this new revised program, we're going to manage roadside trees, and we're going to manage, you know, this section of these roads in this year or next year. Do they reach out to the landowners and say, hey, let's cooperate, we're going to be doing this, why don't you hire a forester? Or does the landowner say, we're going to be managing trees, I have, you know, this many acres of of woodland that are part of the roadside corridor, and then they reach out to the power utility companies. It's, uh, who, who starts the conversation? Is there a good way or a bad way? And then if the landowners reach out, what are, and it's a community that's not familiar with this, what, what kinds of arguments or concerns is the utility manager going to have if they're approached with, with this idea? Well, I think, I think a, a lot of this conversation can start with the landowner, the logger, or the forester, when they're going to have a harvest in back of that land to make people aware, you know, like I said, we need to have these demonstrations so the utility companies can see the value, so the landowners can see that this is an approach that they like. But then the, the landowner, the logger, the forester could approach the power company and say, hey, could you take care of these problematic trees, which are going to take out your wires sooner or later? We'll, we'll take them the rest of the way down, and our management goal in the future is not to let trees get this big. So then it becomes a win-win, and maybe you'd have to reschedule the harvest for, you know, a year or two until it's on the power company's, uh, you know, management cycle. Here in Connecticut, it's four years. It's going to depend upon where you're at. If it's 10 years, maybe you won't be able to work it in, but if there's going to be the utility crews are going to be going through anyways, that drops the cost for the utility companies. Because if this uh, costs money, it's not going to get done. Right. right. And uh, the the other thing is that the utility company generally lets the, uh, the local officials know what their trimming schedule is going forward. And if they have backbone lines in your community uh, where they're going to be doing some enhanced tree trimming uh, along a forested roadside, somebody in the community is going to know about that. And if we've done our job correctly as outreach people to get the community on board, then they can uh, let the word out to people who own the forest land that, uh, yeah, this activity is going to be taking place. Uh, find out if somebody has some, uh, uh, you know, some management uh, activity planned in their management plan or we're thinking about it, uh, you know, make the connections to the professional foresters. The model I would like to see is that uh, the utility actually has a utility forester in addition to the arborists who um, um, is a, who is aware of the the possibility or the opportunity uh, to combine management and maybe connected to uh, other forestry professionals uh, in the area for example the state foresters who manage state lands or the water company forest foresters who manage water company lands you know there could be some communication going on there Okay, um, and just you know, I've been scrolling up and down in the questions, trying to 
trying to synthesize and there's the, the, your your webinar generated uh, as much conversation as I've ever seen so that's a very good thing I'm just but if <laughs> we don't have time to read individual questions so here's one um, uh, what types of trees? So when you're talking about the telephone pole forest, what kinds of trees are you going to? Are, are the ones the characteristics of the trees you would you would top out? And then um, presumably, I think the answer to the second question is about when. How do they bloom? They don't bloom. They're going to be subsequently removed. But so what? What are the characteristics of trees that would go into the top me out category? I'll, uh, I'll tackle that one first. These would be trees sure. that uh, um, are prob can be recognized perhaps at the end of their, at or near the end of their natural lifespan. Uh, and trees that are growing in an asymmetrical um, direction with a lean towards the power line right away or towards the road and or whatever open space you're trying to protect. And um, also trees that may exhibit some uh, visible uh, uh, defect um, th through, uh, uh, you know, typical, um, uh, and I hate to use the word hazard, but hazard tree assessment type of techniques. Um, and um, in trees that uh, are sort of naturally brittle and, you know, break easily in the, um, in, in the wind, I'm thinking of, we see a lot of damage from white pine uh, in, in wind storms. Uh, uh, you know, tulip trees can be like that also. Um, so, Jeff, you want to add to that in some way? No, I think you covered it pretty well. And and related to that, there's a question um, about, so topping the trees is a way to get the trees past the power lines. That presumably is more cost effective than dropping the power lines and then felling the trees and then reestablishing the power lines? Yes. I've never heard of them, uh, you know, dropping the power lines. But one thing that helps with the power companies, too, is we tell them that when they're uh, actually topping out these trees is rather than have someone drag all the brush up to a chipper, which is pretty, you know, bloody labor intensive, it's like let the branches drop because there's going to be a forest harvest back here anyways. Mm -hmm. And, you know, aesthetically that has, you know, some issues, even though ecologically it's better to leave the branches. But that lowers the cost for the power, uh, you know, utility companies because they're not dragging brush everywhere. Right. Okay. And there have uh, so been a couple of comments. It sounds like uh, somebody trying to do this in New Jersey is going to have an uphill battle um, <laughs> with, with the public perceptions. Um, well, and then also, and there's been uh, just so you know, there, as, as you probably surmised, there have been people that think that the, the roadside management looks very good, and there's other people that think that it doesn't look so good. So for what that's. Yeah, um, the, um, the uphill battle, uh, <laughs> this is, we actually suspected this would be the case in, in, uh, in Connecticut in some places, um, and uh, which is why we, we started small. Uh, we put in a few uh, research sites and a few small demonstration sites with the idea that we would have different uh, different stand compositions that we started with, uh, different roadside conditions that we started with, and um, here's the treatment that we uh, decided was appropriate for that site, and um, we can take people and show them what it looks like uh, a year later or two years later, as the case may be, and hopefully this will get us out in front of that message. Uh, and also, uh, you know, the signage. and you know, letting everybody know what our plans were um, up front, you know, that, uh, you know, it, that, uh, um, you know, people were aware that something was going to take place up the road and, um, you know, let's wait and see what happens. So uh, we've, uh, we've actually been pretty pleased with uh, the, the absence of really strenuous complaints, but uh, um, once people hear what, what's underway and what's going on and the reasons for it, why uh, they're generally pretty open-minded. The uh, other thing I would just comment on that, it might be hard to implement, wait until you have one or two big storms. You know, we've gone, what, eight years now with just that one hurricane crossing uh, Florida. Wait until, you know, for those of us that are anywhere within 100, 150 miles of the coast, wait until you get a hurricane and people lose power for a week. Or if you're more out towards uh, the Midwest or, you know, towards the center, Wait until you get another massive ice storm or you've got, you know, a, a mesostorm going through. 
and people were without power for a long time. It's amazing how attitudes suddenly shift a little bit, and that's what happened here. Yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, and it's also a matter of well, you know, we had a we had a hurricane uh, 15 years ago or 20 years ago or something like that. Well, you know, a lot of these trees are 20 years older, and they were old trees back then, and <laughs> now they're even older trees. You know, so um, you know, uh, there's the risk is greater and greater every year that goes by uh, with the trees that are near the end of their natural lifespan. Yeah, the the one thing I would just say, there's a a comment, somebody put in a comment about leaving lion-tailed trees. That's a little bit tricky. We tried to pick trees. I mean, those trees have about uh, a 30% live crown ratio, which granted is pretty much towards the low end. Uh, but we also, what you can't see in there, we picked trees that looked like they had pretty good taper. So these were trees which, the, the two big trees you see in the picture, they were dominant trees, so they did have, you know, a big butt flare. When you're picking those, it, it takes a, a little bit of a look. And it is going to be a risk for the first couple of years uh, after a harvest until those trees, you know, get a little bit more taper on them. Um, but then again, you know, if they're growing naturally lion tail, they're a lot more likely to go over in a storm anyways. So, Jeff, are you, in some of your um, research plots, are you, you're monitoring the uh, increase in percent taper on these trees? Yeah, that was actually, shoot, I wonder if I could find it here really quick. One of the things we did, uh, being forest geeks, is, let me pull it up, slide 42. Tom, can you pass the baton to me? Oh, sorry. No, yeah. no problem. While you guys are doing that, um, one of the participants is thinking it might be uh, good to have you come to New Jersey. I'll, I'll let you all, uh, you have Tom and Jeff's contact information there. I'll, I'll let you work out any details um, on <laughs> travel arrangements sure. and speaking engagements. Yeah. If you look at the <laughs> upper right hand. If it, especially if it's a hostile environment, I'll, I'll let you guys go. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> you go in there, so long as you have donuts, I don't care how hostile it is. <laughs> Uh, if you look at the upper right-hand picture, one of the things we did with all the saw timber and I think 10% of the pole trees is we actually went out there with that handy little gadget and we looked at what the diameter was uh, 16 feet up and so we could get the taper. And okay. so we're going to go back here in a couple of years and actually look at the uh, the taper. And, you know, see the change in taper, because that's a real question. And one of the other things, I mean, we didn't go into all the details. We measured the top and bottom of the live crown and actually did a sort of a weak map of the crown. So we can get an idea of where the trees, not only the bowl center of gravity, because that's measured, but also the crown center of gravity. Because mm-hmm. one of the things we want to do is we don't want to create a problem. We're trying to solve a problem. Right. And this is like any other forestry practice. It's, it's a little bit of art and a little bit of science. And Tom and I both have 30 years of doing this, so we think we're pretty good on yeah. picking trees, and we're definitely going to find out. Yeah, we've Great. looked at we've looked at a lot of the places where they've done a, a shelter wood with reserves or a seed tree type of cut. And uh, you know, the wind comes along the next year, you lose a, you lose a few trees. That's uh, you know, we understand that that kind of thing happens. It takes some takes some time before the trees adapt to that change, but they do. Um, in addition to what the, the measurements that Jeff collected uh, on the three sites where we have the, the tree biomechanics um, um, research underway, uh, we actually have we actually forced the graduate student to put on a harness and climb up the ladder, you know, 10 meters up and and take these measurements in some detail as well. So we'll have a little bit more detailed uh, uh, data as well to work with. Great. So last question um, is, and it's come up in a couple of, uh, by a couple of participants is, and maybe it's a matter of, you know, waiting or waiting for the financial analysis, but the alternative to this, uh, at least from a power line perspective, you know, not from a road corridor perspective, is burying power lines underground. You know, and the cost of doing that versus the cost of, so you have a one-time cost of putting the lines underground, uh, presumably, and I'm guessing, the maintenance of, of, of those underground lines is going to be less than the maintenance of above-ground lines. And so, you know, using that as, you know, comparing that as a economic 
um, option to uh, continual maintenance of, of roadside vegetation. Well, that might it might be somewhat financially feasible in areas where they've got deep soils. I was going to say here in Connecticut, I saw there's some people from the Adirondacks and the Jersey Highlands where you've got rock right underneath. Uh, financially, it's, it's damn near impossible. Then you start running into right of way issues. But I think one of the more interesting things is we saw a couple of studies were done in the Mid Atlantic, and I think one out of Florida when I was part of that larger group. And underground utilities have fewer powder, power outages, but when they have a power outage, they last a lot longer because it's the Dickens to repair those lines. Oh, so if you look, okay. and there are some during storms, so if you actually look at the number of customer hours that are out from storms, there's almost no difference between above ground and below ground utilities, hmm. which surprised the heck out of us. Yeah. There, huh. are some, there are some underground utilities being placed where there's new construction. Uh, where it seems appropriate, and so they're very well aware that, you know, of this option. Um, but um, you know, when you weigh everything uh, um, involved, as Jeff mentioned, why you know it, uh, um, it it might always might not always be advisable. You know, plus uh, along a wooded roadside, you know, people are concerned about the, um, uh, you know. Well, the trees, you're going to have to cut some trees down. Well, you know, if you take a backhoe and you dig up the ground to put in an underground power line, well, you're going to do a lot of damage to the roots, too. <laughs> so, you know, you may not win either way. Right. And that's what Pink just shared a comment that, you know, in, in parts of mid-Jersey, you know, burying the lines is, is not even an option. So, yeah. Okay. Well, guys, you've uh, you've done a great job and, and been very patient with half an hour worth of questions. I appreciate that. We've retained 50 participants through uh, through an extra 30 minutes. And, and for that, I'm appreciative. So we're going to, I'm going to turn off the recording. And.